Thank you. We'll wait one second to get everyone in the waiting room in. Okay, um, since it's 8.01, I guess we'll get started. Um, hi everyone, thank you for joining the meeting today. Uh, today, I'm just we're just gonna be doing our how to conduct a systematic review of literature for four science and other disciplines. And this is through a joint IFSA and IUFRO task force on forestry education um, presentation. Uh, so I'm gonna let Sandra do a brief introduction to the Joint Task Force with Aifra. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Okay, first of all, I would like to thank um, IFSA organizers, in particular, Annie Bijou, for all the organization here and support to be able to conduct this workshop. Of course, I want to thank the past president uh, and our new president in ITSA, um, Isabella. I also want to thank Matilda for taking the risk, <laughs> helping us here in a short time notice. Um, also for you to attend and I hope this uh, workshop is, is productive for you, helpful for you, and of course it will accomplish the goals that we expect to accomplish. Um, IUFRO, what is IUFRO? IUFRO is the International Union of Forest Research Organization. It's an organization that it has more than 131 years. Um, through the years, the organization has been developed and it's been reaching um, almost 150 in countries around the world, um, reuniting researchers, scientists in the forest sector, forest and forestry sector. It is a nonprofit organization. What means is that uh, all the work that we do here is in voluntary basis. And also it's unique in in, in the terms of forestry, because it's around the globe, as I said, and as I said, and it reunites scientists and um, has a very uh, well developed network of colleagues around the world, and also is the, is a member of the International Science Council. Oh my God! Oh yeah. Our mission is to be the voice of forest science, of course, promoting a sustainable future of forest and society. How are you from work? Uh, as I say, reuniting 15,000 scientists is not as easy. Therefore, there is a, a headquarters that can coordinate us and also um, we we work based on our um, expertise, and I, I later show how that works. And uh, we work through organizations, uh, as it is the International Union of Forest Research Organizations. It's um, organizations that work on forest research, um, join, um, the network and through them, the scientists join IUFRA. Uh, through the, every year or uh, we have different meetings uh, in different countries, even online, social distance. And also we have um, not, not only meetings, but also uh, congresses, symposiums um, and, different scientific um, workshops.
our structure, uh, we have an international council, members from different, uh, from the all regions of the world. Uh, I mean, persons who are scientists in different regions are members of the international council. We also have the board, a management committee, the secretariat that is in, in, in Vienna, and they are who administrate this union, nine divisions, uh, Within the divisions, we have research groups and working parties. Then we have, at this point, nine tax forces and five special programs and projects. And here is our, the picture of um, our presidents and vice presidents and, and our executive direct, director. The divisions. Uh, we have nine divisions in different, and uh, we cover all aspects of forest science, like silviculture. And uh, just to give you an example, forest products, forest environment, and forest policy and economics. And uh, within each division, we have the working parties and also the um, units. For example, the social aspects of forest and forestry. We have a working party on forest education. And from that, then we have a, our tax force as well. So what means is that the tax force is um, belongs to the division six. Uh, here are the tax forces. And what are tax forces? Tax forces are um, groups uh, of scientists that work in topics that are underdeveloped and that are urgent to um, promote, like the case of forest education, for example. So we have nine at this point, and we changed the uh, tax forces every two years. But um, we've been lucky as the tax force on forest education, which is a joint cooperation with um, IFSA, that we've been renovated for the last six years. Next year is our last time. Okay, and here it's what is, what is the joint new fruits a tax force on forest education for these new terms. As I say, it has it's been around for six years, and I think Annie has more information about Annie. Do you? Hi, sorry. Yeah, so um, we we uh, we are going to um, our task force is going to be entered in the next year with the IFO Congress in Stockholm, and uh, our present activities are the global competition on best practices, uh, the IFO Symposium on forest education, which uh, which was last week. And then the upcoming Congress itself, we have a subplenary session and two uh, technical sessions. And also finally, we are uh, part of a research on how to utilize many facet uh, rash model, uh, which is being headed by Dr. Pipet. So uh, those are our ongoing activities. And yeah, that, that, that's about it. Thank you. Thank you, Annie. And yes, something that I want to say through the through through these six years, we've been having more than twenty workshops for the students, and we've been um, reunited with more than one thousand students, uh, a little bit more <laughs> of one thousand students, um, helping us doing uh, attending these workshops that are prepared for you, um, because that was one of the main points when we establish the tax force to help the students to acquire some competences that they cannot acquire in their regular classes. Um, and although that was the first goal, we accomplished so many other things that we later will show you uh, later uh, until next year, we will we'll show you our accomplishment. At this point, I, I just want to cut so then you will have um good time for your class and I just want to thanks again to you 
uh, for helping us uh, understanding what uh, forest students um, are expecting, what are your challenges, and we are we hope that we have uh, somehow contribute to ameliorate those um, or, or to fill those gaps that um, you can all fill with the regular classes in the universities. Uh, for me, it's a pleasure to be part of this uh, coordination and thank you, Matilda. The microphone is yours. I actually, Matilda, right before you present, I did want to share one thing about IFSA real quick. Yes, I thought so as well. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you, Sandra, for um, talking a little bit about IUFRO. Um, I just wanted to give a quick introduction to IFSA as well before we get started. Um, so if you're new, what is IFSA? It's the largest international association for students of forestry and related fields. It was established in 1990 by motivated students organizing student symposiums since 1973. The IFSA vision is a world that appreciates forests and the mission is to enrich our members education through international events, networking and intercultural exchange. The IFSA strategy goals are, again, international networking, enabling students to engage globally, and taking learning beyond education. So the aim of this session is to help students to carry out proper systematic review of literature, SLR, for forest science with step-by-step -step guidelines. And we'll be providing information on various open databases for accessing literature for forest sciences. And just some general housekeeping rules. Um, we highly recommend keeping your microphones turned off so we don't disturb the speakers. There will be a Q&A session organized towards the end of the session. And during this, we suggest that you raise your hand and um, I'll call on you or I'll look for your questions in the chat box um, as the moderator. And yeah, again, if you don't feel like using your microphone, you're welcome to write questions in the chat box throughout the presentation. And this session will be video recorded and posted on the YouTube channel for viewing later, at a later time. And so just to introduce our speaker before we get started, um, we have Matilda van den Bosch um, with us. And she is a senior researcher at the Barcelona Institute for Global Health and is an in-house consultant at the European Forest Institute BioCities facility in Rome. She is also an adjunct professor at the University of British Columbia, Canada. And she has a background in medicine and landscape planning and her interdisciplinary research analyzes the interconnections between human health and the health of natural environments. Her goal is to contribute to policies and practices that acknowledge the interdependence between healthy environments and healthy people. And so, yeah, I just wanted to thank you one more time for coming out and speaking to us and I will share the floor with you. Thank you so much, Casey. It's lovely to be here. Shall I start sharing my screen immediately? Um, yeah, that works. That's probably the best. Let me see. Right. That should be it, right? It looks good. Okay, thank you. So thanks a lot, Casey and and Sandra and Annie as well for for um, for introducing me. So uh, yes, so the the topic or the title is how to conduct a literature review in forest science and other disciplines. And I I would like to say uh, before I continue is that when I got this task, I told uh, told the kind organizers that. Um, I'm not, uh, I, I do work as, as noticed at the European Forest Institute, but I'm not a forest scientist per se. So I want you to be aware of that. I have, I have much more, I have a health background and then I'm looking as I said at the interactions with, with, uh, with forest environments, for example. Um, so I just, I, I will do as much as I can uh, in terms of the general aspects of literature review and how to do this kind of searches systematically. 
Um, and I'm super happy to to answer questions. And if you want to reach out to me afterwards on email and so on, you're very welcome to do so. My my email will be indicated by the end uh, of the lecture. Uh, yes, thank you. Really, uh, I do think I I I am think this initiative is is fantastic. Can you hear me? Yeah. No, sorry, it was some some noise behind. Um, I, I think this is a great initiative. And when uh, when Casey said this thing, I didn't know actually, I'd been working with IOFRO, but not so much with IFSA and this thing that, to, that your goal is uh, a world that appreciates forests. I think that is really something I would like to contribute to as well. Uh, so kudos for that. And thanks a lot for giving me the opportunity to talk to you today. And I'm very happy to see there were so many registered students. Um, yes, and before I continue as well, I would like to say that um, I was initially um, informed that I was going to talk for two hours, so I have my presentation is, is structured for, for two hours talk, and we will not really have two hours, I think. Um, so please bear with me as well if I glance over a few things, and as I said, we can go back to those later, or send me an email or something. Um, because I will have to improvise a little bit today uh, with uh, what to, to bring into the seminar and not. Equally, uh, since I was thinking this would be for two hours, I was thinking, oh gosh, I need to get you interacting a little bit to keep you awake. So I planned for Kahoot and these kind of things, you know, interactive uh, questions and polling questions and so on. But it did not work with the free version, unfortunately. So we'll, uh, we'll figure out some... Uh, in a way so keeping this as engaging as possible anyhow so um the, a little outline of this uh, workshop so the again this was for the two hours uh structure i was thinking to first talk a little bit more in general why you do this literature review and and how to identify which type of review you want to conduct and then to develop a protocol which is much related to the objectives and the research questions you have. And then for the second hour, then uh, I wanted to go a little bit more into the methods and more specific, uh, like like uh, Casey mentioned, step by step, uh, how to work through things. Uh, we'll see how far we get. But the idea is to, I, th I think a few important things that we will touch upon are like search terms and the search syntax, which is key for developing a systematic review or literature review. And then databases that you can look into and the screening of the records and data extraction, presentation of results and recommendations. This is basically what we would typically include in a methodology for a literature review. Okay, so I also, I wrote this thing uh, that I wanted you to ask questions or comments uh, by raising your hand in the, in the, um, yeah, like in the Zoom function or right in the chat and then answer the Kahoot questions that will not happen. Now I saw that um, Annie preferred, or maybe the, you're used to doing this more like in the afterwards, like in the Q&A session. So that's that's fine with me. Uh, either works well with me. I mean, Casey, if you monitor and you see there is a question in the chat or something and you feel this is really relevant to ask right now, it's, it's fine to interrupt me. You raise your hand, for example, and uh, we can take it from there. Uh, whatever works for you works for me in this in this context, honestly. Okay, you ready? Then we get started. So um, literature review, scientific literature reviews of different kinds. Uh, the first one was published in 1753 by James Lind, a treatise on the scurvy, which is a disease uh, related to a lack of C vitamin, vitamin. And uh, this was published in London uh, some 300 years ago soon. And I just wanted to bring this up because it's interesting because here you see they, uh, what he, I you cannot see it maybe, but like in the image, it says that it is uh, a critical view of what has been published on the subject. 
And I just found it fascinating when I looked into this to start thinking about, okay, in 1753, I wonder how much was actually published on the subject. Because what you will see, one of the issues we're facing today, when there are so many studies, there's so much research going on, which is fantastic, of course, but it, it's it's become challenging when you want to, to, to really review it and to scrutinize and look at the level of evidence and so on. We will um, touch upon this more a little bit later. Uh, I just thought it was fascinating that it was actually a survey, uh, a, a review back then. And then years passed and and by the my birth year in 1972, Archie Cochrane um, published his Effectiveness and Efficiency Random Reflections on Health Service, uh, which was a reflection on the need for, for systematic reviews. Uh, and it came as an answer to policymakers and clinicians that, that demanded, who demanded research synthesis to be able to use the best possible evidence for uh, using the best possible uh, treatments. Because this is um, the systematic reviews, literature reviews uh, are developed, were developed within the medical literature, uh, within the medical sciences. and and. I stress this because as you will see as we go through the methods a little bit uh, further on is that it's, it's, it's really much designed for medical studies and that doesn't it doesn't always go perfectly well with for example studies in forestry or environmental sciences and so on so that's why it's important to keep this in mind uh, as said today there are many different disciplines that conduct reviews to systematically summarize available evidence this is the point with um with the systematic review or with the literature review so i said that many disciplines do this today however uh, the grand majority of systematic reviews are conducted in medicine and health sciences. And the question is, why? And here, <laughs> I initially had a polling question. I don't have an answer to this myself. Uh, so that's why I would, would have been interested in, in hearing your thoughts and opinions, why you think that those are mostly conducted in medicine. I mean, you can reflect upon, okay, we need, we need evidence-based guidelines for how to treat patients and so on, but uh, we do actually need evidence-based guidelines for how to treat the environment and ecosystems and forest managements and, uh, as well. I think it might be that now I'm speculating, it might be a reflection of a sort of uh, anthropocentric worldview, isn't it? That it's uh, we need evidence space for how to treat people, but but maybe not so much considered that we need evidence space for treating the environment as well. I just bring this up. I think it's uh, something for you to reflect upon. Uh, why there has not been so much interest, maybe from from policymakers or so on for for addressing. Uh, the evidence level of forestry research. Because um, there is a value, the value of systematic evidence synthesis in forestry land use and development to improve research decision-making and practice. This was published a couple of years ago in the scientific journal Forests. So um, they say that despite these well-established procedures and so on, Blah, blah, blah. The uptake of these rigorous methods of synthesizing relevant literature has been disappointingly slow in forestry and related fields. You see, this is nudging you now, right? You, <laughs> it's still been very slow, but you have the chance to can pick up on this. And so it's, that I think it's fantastic that the IOFRAN uh, are organizing this workshop because there is, there is a lot of work to do. And it's, um, as a student, I thought it was fun to realize, oh, there are gaps we need there there is there's a reason for the work i i do or i want to do okay uh so for, for before going to start preparing this workshop or this webinar i thought okay let me just try in one of the more common databases the one that i am often using scopus so I just searched in the title for forest and systematic review um can you see when i used it do you see with my my cursor here. I don't think we can see it. Okay, all right. But uh, anyhow, so if you see there um, in the in the upper parts, <laughs> the search documents, forest and systematic review. Then I found only one hundred and sixty-two documents actually, which is not a lot. 
And if we then go into this and look at this a little bit further, you can use this function in Scopus, looking at um, analyzing the, the data, the information you get out from your search. For example, here you can see what disciplines, what subject areas, the 162 articles represented. And you see there is uh, environmental sciences and agriculture, but uh, more than 10% are reflected are actually uh articles that should be in medicine which is a little bit strange right if we search for forests why do we get articles from the medical discipline let's look into that now there's a kahoot um so uh, and this is another um analysis a graph of the the results from this search and you see that in 2002 was the first there seems to be something going on there in 2003 and then it's not until around 2016 that is picking up and more and more reviews systematic reviews uh, on forests seem to be be published so here we have the golden 2002 paper let's see what that could be it's an article in medicine so it's about infectious disease occurrence in forestry workers so it's not about the forest per se i just wanted to 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 say this because it's uh, talking about an anthropocentric uh, worldview, it's, uh, well, it's, of course, this is a very important topic. I just want to say, okay, so we first get happy, we get an article here, a systematic review on forests, but it's actually about human health instead. Okay, so what you can do as well in the, the Scopus and in most databases is that you can filter your research or your, your, um, your results, your results from the search and limit it in various ways. For example, you can filter it by subject area. So here I excluded medicine. Uh, so I don't want what I basically tell the, the, the database is, okay, I don't want results that represent medicine. And then we get down to 128 documents, which should then be hopefully more relevant. And you see then uh, that's, Yes, so that from 2002 is gone because that was within the field of environment, of medicine, sorry. And then it stays very low until 2011 and 2012 comes the first ones. Uh, so here in 2011, the reliable forest carbon monitoring is systematic reviews as a tool for validating the knowledge base, highly relevant uh, systematic review. And then 2012, another one from forest to farm, systematic review or cultivar feeding, etc. And 2012, non-timber forest products, uh, systematic review of that as well. And if we do the same graph, looking at what subject areas are covered, it makes more sense. Environmental sciences, agricultural and biological sciences, and then the social sciences, which, for example, you could imagine that non-timber products would uh, fall within this category. Yeah, maybe let's stop by this at least, uh, even if you cannot <laughs> respond, you could give, give yourself 15 seconds to think, what is the purpose of a literature review for you? What would you think? Yeah, I wish we could interact more. Uh, it's, it would be nice to be in the same room as all of you and be able to talk a little bit more. Anyhow, uh, so maybe you have come up with a few of these things uh, when you were thinking about the purpose of a systematic review. So the, the key or one of the main aims is of course to synthesize prior, prior studies. So you look at everything that has been done before and you summarize it, that's, that's one, one objective. And to look at the knowledge to comprehensively record that on a particular topic of interest, identify knowledge gaps. Why is that important? Because then we know what other research must, must be done. And also look at methodological shortcomings, um, what methods can be used in the future to, to provide better uh, knowledge and evidence and identify the quality of evidence. We will talk more about the quality of evidence later, um, but this is important. Uh, and also to inform decision makers and stakeholders and improve future research. Yes, so this informing of decision makers and stakeholders makes sense because you can't really use, uh, well, you're all aware of that. You can't use like anecdotal evidence. You can't use a case study to implement policies or re uh, recommendations, general recommendations. You need a body of research for that, right? So that is what we also use the systematic reviews for or various types of literature reviews. 
I would say that really the ultimate goal is to strengthen strengthen the foundation of knowledge. And if you're into to studies and research, this is this is what we're all trying to do, right? We're trying to improve knowledge in the society and reducing reviews and strict review methodologies, we can actually strengthen this foundation. We want to contribute to knowledge that can have an impact on the society and the environment. So maybe I should go over this a little bit quicker. And um, some, some of those things are related to the things here are related to what I mentioned about the objectives. So what, what we do with the added value is that we uh, get insights into what is already known and what is not known. We, we, we're looking at the methodologies and analysis of the methods that have been used. And theories is an interesting uh, thing as well. Depending on your subject area, there are various uh, theories that can that have been implemented and tested empirically and so on. And then with a review, you can figure out to what extent those have been supported or not. Uh, and the relevance for real world applications, I mentioned already that it is uh, one of the main goals is to use the results for policies and planning and recommendations and so on. And conceptual models can also be uh, a result of, uh, of a systematic review, or in particular, a scoping review, actually. I brought this one in because I've just we, we are just about to finalize a scoping review where we looked at um, forest-based carbon sinks and the human health co-benefits. So the, the purpose of the review was to look at the nexus of research between forest-based climate change mitigation and human health and to what extent those two different those two areas have been or have not been uh, considered in junction. And so we came up with a, a, one of the results of this review, um, which I will talk a little bit more about later as well. One of the results was this conceptual model, uh, where for, for me, it was important to, to be able to put the health co-benefits within the ecosystem services concept. That I'm pretty... Uh, sure that uh, most of you are very well aware of the ecosystem services concept but i'm working mostly with health researchers people in in the health sciences and disciplines and most many of them don't know what ecosystem services are and for me i think it's a useful concept when we're talking about the the interactions between the environments and the the interdependence between humans and the environment and so for me it was important to see that from this literature we could actually put the health benefits within to an ecosystem services concept and relate that then to more specific health outcomes okay so when do we do a review well the very we simple answer is is when there is a need for it if we feel there is a need to to synthesize knowledge which could be when there is a sufficient amount of studies and no review is available on the topic this is uh important as well because we when we conduct reviews we are supposed to register them as well in repositories that okay so we, we draft the protocol which will go through and then we can register this protocol and say that um, so, so, so other researchers know, OK, something is going on already on this. So you check your um, the register, the repository first before you do a review yourself and you check, of course, in, in, in literature if something has been done. Or when a certain amount of time has passed since the last review effort was done. A certain amount of time is impossible, depends on the 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 speed of the publications in the in the area but um like say 10 years for example if it could be that given the speed of research given the speed of studies published we might need new reviews you know, after after 10 years or so yeah there are many different scientific reviews literature reviews many many different types so this is uh this is from the University of Melbourne. They have made this nice tree of different review families. And as you can see, there are loads, many, many, many different types of reviews. Uh, traditional reviews, which might be what 
what um, they did in the 1753 paper, uh, like it's more um, a narrative, like a story of what has been going on. And then rapid reviews and quality reviews, looking at qualitative uh, studies and research. I know very little about that, so I will not even go there. And a mixed method review is when you use both, of course. Uh, what we will look at a little bit more today, which would be the more uh, typical conventional types of reviews are within the systematic reviews family, systematic review and meta-analysis, and also scoping review, which would sort under the purpose-specific reviews family, uh, looking at for example, the scoping review I mentioned, we didn't know actually, we didn't know whether there was any research at all that had looked at this nexus. So there was the purpose was to look at whether uh, whether that had happened or not. So how do you choose? Um, you have your research question, or your research objects, uh, your review objectives, and then you can then you need to decide what type of review, and you. You can do this in many ways. Again, I just wanted to bring this to you intent to your attention. It's from the University of Melbourne as well. They have some good have some good material for reviews, literature reviews. And for example, if you're so the first question here is if whether your search will be limited to a specific study type. I would say that most of the times it will not be. There's a very, very specific. If you, for example, just want to look at the randomized controls trials, for example, uh, then you can do that. Otherwise, if you say no, the next question you come to then is whether the review will follow specific and systematic guidelines, assuming that this is what we do. Uh, if you're going to do something more methodologically strict, that would be a yes. And then does it need to compare, evaluate, and synthesize evidence? Uh, if you say yes, then it's a systematic review family. And if it's not so much about comparing and evaluating and synthesizing the evidence, but more looking at uh, identifying knowledge gaps, not looking in particular at the quality of the evidence, but looking at uh, what is going on out there, what are the knowledge gaps and so on, then you're probably looking into doing a scoping review instead. Right, so this was the Kahoot question. Um, so as with any study, also in literature reviews, you have your research questions, uh, which are at the, at the front of everything you do. So the research questions for a systematic review could be, for example, what is the evidence level for? What treatments are available for? What is the effectiveness of blah, blah, blah. And this is what you would fill in. While in a scoping review is more what has been done in this research field, what populations have been included, what progress has been made in the research. As you can see, the difference is sometimes a little bit shady. You need to, to, to have a few more examples to, to, to better get an even better grasp of it. But you see that um, for the scoping reviews, it's not so much about finding specific uh, answer to specific uh, evidence level question, but it's more to scope what is going on out there. As I said, a few examples can be useful to better understand. So this is, I'm part of a Horizon Europe funded project. We just started, Resonate is called. Uh, we're looking at nature-based therapies. And one of the tasks within this project is to conduct a systematic review of the evidence for health impacts of nature-based therapies. And the objectives of this one uh, is to identify types of native-based therapies and types of health outcomes that are addressed and to summarize knowledge, to identify the evidence level for the impact of native-based therapies on various health outcomes, and to define effect sizes, if it's possible, depends on the, the whether there has been a homogeneous way of measuring health impacts or not. And then to provide input for a systematic mapping. Once, once you've figured out uh, the evidence, where, where nature-based therapies are going on, you can consider map these to have a, an idea about the global distribution of nature-based therapies as well. So these better objectives. And then if you look at the research questions, um, you can boil it down to basically what is the evidence level for nature-based therapies for various health outcomes and for what health outcomes are nature-based therapies most efficient. 
Uh, for a scoping review, then, the other one I mentioned, uh, scoping review of human health co-benefits of forest-based climate change mitigation in Europe. Yes, this we, we conducted this just for Europe, not uh, necessarily because we it would be mo more important there, but basically to what this happens often, that you need to find different ways of limiting, limit your search because you tend to end up with a lot of... Um, records and studies to go through otherwise. So in this case, we limited it by geographical scope and systematically mapped the research on the topic in Europe. And we identified nexuses between research on forest-based climate change mitigation and health co-benefits and suggested methods for future research. These were the objectives. And the research questions for this scoping review was more than are human co-benefits included in research analyzing forest space carbon sink potential at all? And if so, what exposure pathways and health outcomes have been included and how have they been analyzed? And what research methods are most promising to advance the understanding of synergies and trade-offs related to human co-benefits of forest-based climate change mitigation? Well, as you see, one of the, the key objectives is often to, to push the, the, the field forward to help future research ourselves and other researchers to how can we how can we improve this the, the methods and the research to get even better knowledge to contribute to a stronger fundament base. Yeah, I don't know if it's maybe maybe this is an exercise you can do afterwards to to think about the research questions that you might have. Um, I I would have loved to know a little bit more about who you are and what you're studying and what, what uh, level you are in your studies and so on, uh, and how much um, independent research work you have been doing yourself within your studies and so on. Um, in, in any case, as we continue, I, I would encourage you to keep it in, in mind a little bit to, to, because I can only talk about the, the few topics um, I've been involved in and you do completely different things to try. So if you try and keep in your mind what your research questions actually are, what you are interested in uh, and how you can implement these methods to address your objectives, I think it will be more relevant. I wanted to bring to your attention, there are a lot of resources actually out there now on different um, ways of conducting reviews. For example, the Joanna Biggs Institute, the JBI, uh, they have fantastic material if you conduct, if you're planning to conduct a scoping review. Uh, you can visit the website and you will find a lot of material, guidelines, videos, tutorials, and so on. Uh, so if you're if you are planning on ever doing a, a scoping review, I would strongly recommend you to visit this. And for systematic reviews, the most um, the, what you typically go for is the Prisma uh, guidelines. The, and this is also you can find it online. The Prisma statement is highly detailed. Um, recommendations, guidelines, methodologies, exactly for how do you, how to do a systematic review. And to be honest with you, if you publish a systematic review today without referring to the Prisma statements, it will be hard to get it published in a good quality journal. Um, oh, shouldn't have said that. Uh, this goes mostly for health research. I think, though, that you need to acknowledge that you know what Prisma is. This is sort of um, uh, a fundament for all the other systematic review methods that came afterwards. And the the if you're looking more into environmental sciences, there is something called ROSIS, which I am unfortunately not very familiar with. Uh, but I found this resource, this this paper, where they have a lot. I mean, this this is a paper, but they also have links to a lot of different uh, tools to help you conduct a systematic review in environmental sciences and how to report it and the standards for that. And finally, talking about other resources, I would strongly recommend you to look into the Collaboration for Environmental Evidence as well. It's a fantastic website, uh, Environmental Evidence, CEE. Uh, again, with a lot, a lot, a lot of material and really good guidance for how to develop protocols, for how to frame your research questions, for how to identify your, your search terms and so on for, for you for in particular environmental sciences. Okay, 
Um, when you're embarking on a literature review journey, like with any other study or research, the most important is to plan it really, really well to start with. Sometimes, I don't know what you are like, but I can sometimes feel like, okay, I want to get going, I want to get started. So let's just go do this quick and go into directly into the search. That's not going to work. <laughs> it, it rarely works, but absolutely with, with systematic reviews or literature reviews in general, you will end up with the wrong results if you're not planning really carefully um, to start with. And to do that, you, you, you have defined your research questions or your objectives at least, and then you want to figure out what is already known approximately around this which means that you need to read the the previous papers and and i would suggest i think it's a good idea to try and find the the, the pioneering studies in the topic uh, because they can often um, give you some ideas of theories like i mentioned before and also in, in general i think it's important for us uh, to realize that we stand up on the shoulders of giants as we say sometimes i see with reviews and, and new studies coming up there okay but they actually did this that years ago and I think well it's, I'm sure you agree that's a little bit of a waste uh, and reinventing the wheel okay and then write down your main ideas this is something you can do it on a on a it's a whiteboard with, with your colleagues, whatever, or you scratch yourself and you do what, what I mean. It's like make this a creative iterative process, identify your objectives and nail your research questions. Do this and do this iteratively. Do it interactively with others, with yourself or whoever, but really go, go it through many, many times. And uh, then eventually you can draft the protocol. I just put this... Um, boring list and oh, no it's not a boring list but this is the most cited documents around native-based therapies as i said this is what i'm working on right now so that's why i picked this one uh, the list of the most cited uh, documents on nature assisted therapy and this kind of you can also get this um well this is this is a good one way to start to 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 get your mind going to look at what has been published before and what has been most cited and so on Right, I already said that you can do this by yourself, but if, if any supervisor or professor or whatever tells you that you should do a review on your own, you can tell her or him that that's not going to work. A review is always a teamwork and it's not about the, 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 the point to, to have to have any quality in the review, you need to have some sort of uh, objectiveness and one person is always subjective, so you need to work together, you need to be always at least two, okay. Um, yeah, I find this interesting. This is uh, something I have not been doing myself, but I think it's a good thing to, to consider. Um, when you embark on a review, it's often something either your supervisor or a project tells you, okay, this is a task you, you should do, and you do it. But I think it can be important to take a step back and think, okay, uh, do we actually need this? Yes, maybe for science, but, but is it needed outside academia? Do other stakeholders, other foresters, other practitioners actually need this review? Is there any uh, demand for, 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 for better evidence? And so this group uh, of researchers, they conducted a survey that was sent out to stakeholders to ask about their needs. Uh, and they wanted to have their feedback and insights about the topic per se and the search strategies. And this would be to minimize the bias as well and increase the transparency of the review process. And was I highlighted in green down here, uh, the topic expert. So they actually asked the reviewers, uh, asked the stakeholders, do you believe, do you, do you actually think that this requires more research? Which is, I, th I think, thought it was an interesting question to consider. And then they also asked if there are other sources of information, uh, like databases, we usually have a pretty good clue of, uh, scientific databases, but they can also be organizational websites and so on that we as researchers within academia might not be aware of. Uh, so I just thought it was a good idea, something for you to consider if you will embark on this kind of journey in the future. Uh, right, the review protocol is a very methodological, straightforward thing. Uh, you, This is part of the planning of your review. You draft the protocol and there are templates for do, doing this. For the scoping review, you find it on the Joanna Bix Institute website and for the systematic, you find it on the Prisma website if we focus on these two types. Uh, the protocol for a scoping review uh, include, includes an introduction, the rationale, 
and uh, for why you do the review and then you have to include the review questions i say that's the most important part and i say that in general for where for for um whatever research you do, whatever study, the, the, the questions is, is you really need to nail that and then you answer that. It's it's because otherwise you 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 don't know what you're doing after a while. Um, eligibility criteria for scoping reviews. Uh, what we usually think about there is the participants. What are the participants uh, that are we want to have represented in the review? What concept and what context? And then uh, the types of uh, sources like experimental studies, review studies, and so on. So what we mean with eligibility criteria is that those have to be defined before um, before embarking on the review so we know what studies shall be included and what shall be excluded. So I wanted to... Oh, no, sorry, I'm... My... My screen is, yeah, I'm seeing. Okay. Uh, all right. So, talking about uh, so for a scoping review, the, the PCC eligibility criteria, and um, this is from the scoping review. I think. I just bring in this this uh, example um, because some, sometimes it's easier to follow if you have an example to look at. So this is still the scoping review on carbon sinks, forest-based carbon sinks and health uh, co-benefits. So the participants were considered as the entire European population without any predefined characteristic or criteria. As you can imagine, in many medical reviews, the participants are, for example, okay, people with cardiovascular disease. It could be uh, children with cancer or other more specific um, populations. But in this case, it was uh, very general. We wanted to look at climate change mitigation, right? And then the concept was any type of forest-based climate change mitigation activity. And in, in that would could relate to what we otherwise talk about as intervention. Uh, but this was the intervention was um, forest-based carbon sinks. And then the review context referred to uh, the aim of identifying human co-benefits of forest management strategies and forest characteristics that affect carbon sink potential. These are the things you need to think through for your own topic. Uh, so when we continue with the with the protocol, so this is we're still working on the protocol. In the protocol, you include the introduction, the review questions, the eligibility criteria, and then you include the methods. These are the things. So these are what you do before you you, you start your review, right? You need to have these things nailed before. And in the methods, what you list there are the exclusion criteria, and that can be many different things for example many reviews just look at for example the last decade of research and many unfortunately look at or unfortunately because that's that's a limitation a common limitation that we only can look at english literature for example because uh, we lack resources and knowledge of other other languages uh geographical scope like i said we did only in europe for example and some some you can also exclude based on the study designs excluding, for example, quality of research if it doesn't fit your purpose. Um, information sources need to be defined as well. And usually it's different electronic databases based on scientific discipline and you can have gray literature. And the general suggestions I would have for databases is Scopus, Google Scholar and Web of Science. Uh, they are the most common, I think. And uh, if you start with those, I'm not saying those are the ones you have to stick to, but you can start with those to get some ideas. And then you look at the reference lists of the articles and you can also contact authors and organizations like in the stakeholder survey I mentioned and look at previous reviews, for example. Based uh, and, the, and then in the protocol, you need to define also the search strategy, which is based on the search string and the search syntax. We will come back to that and uh, how you select, how you scan and screen the, the records, and then how you want to do the data extraction, how you find the information in the articles, and how you're going to present it all. This is then for us. So I'm, I'm going through this a little bit quicker now because I think it's uh, going to breeze through, and then we can go into a few details, which I think would be more relevant. 
And for the, so that was the scoping review. Now we come to the systematic review. And I highlighted here in the very first part of the systematic review protocol, uh, some very administrative information, which is pretty basic. I just highlighted here the authors, uh, which is very important. And maybe it depends completely what uh, culture, academic culture you are in, but um, as a young researcher and early career researcher, as a student, it's very important that you uh, protect your rights, so to say. And one good way of doing this is to always put up front whenever you start a study or if it is a review or whatever. But if you if you are tasked to do a review which will be published, it has to be clear from start that, that you are going to be the first author and then what the rest of the authors are contributing with. I just think it's a good practice in general to have that described how each author will, will contribute throughout the process. Uh, this, this sort of lays the ground for justice and for a really collaborative process, which is beneficial for, for everyone and for the results of science. Um, the PICO, participants, interventions, comparators, and outcomes is, is central for a systematic review. Uh, it's, it's, it puts the, 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 the research questions into the context of participants, interventions, comparators, and outcomes. For example, this one uh, is actually a systematic review that I found in this uh, forest uh, systematic review search. How effective are purchase in promoting bird mediated seed dispersal of natural forest regeneration, a systematic review protocol. Uh, so this is this is a topic that I have zero knowledge about. So it's just to show you a little bit uh, the, about the structure. And here as well, I should bring to your attention that this is this is a published paper, and this is a systematic review protocol. So this is before, even before they actually did any searches. This is just this protocol, which is like a recipe book. This is how we are going to do it. We haven't done it, but this is how we are going to do it. And um, that's that's part of the, the scientific process as well, right? It's transparency. Okay, you define on beforehand what you do, otherwise you get bias in, in your results. And so you see, they managed to use this uh, health-derived, medical-derived um, structure of PICO, the population. They say this de degraded areas near a forest and intervention is the different types of purchase. And they look at comparators, um, like temporal and spatial, different outcomes. And then moderators is something you can consider uh, including as well uh, in your protocol. For example, um, a typical moderator would be, um, what can I say? Well, in, in, in my field, a typical moderator is gender, for example, okay? So we do, okay, we have evidence for this and this uh, nature-based therapy on this and this health outcome. Is this impact moderated by gender? Is there a difference between, between uh, men and women and so on, for example? There are different types of moderates. So here, for example, I see they have precipitation variation. Is there a difference in the results depending on uh, precipitation? These are things you can be interested in looking at through your systematic review. Um, further on in this uh, protocol, you're supposed to list your different methods as well. And there you look at the legibility criteria, which we already touched upon, different information sources, same as for the scoping review. And the search strategy is, is uh, similar as well. You use search terms and search string and search syntax. Um, and then the study records. Um, there's a lot about the, the techniques, the technicalities that you're going to use for, for, for these study records. And assessing risk of bias and data synthesis and meta bias is not so interesting. Confidence and cumulative evidence, which is obviously the final conclusion. Describe how the strengths of the body of evidence will be assessed by some sort of tool like the grade. All uh, right. <laughs> okay, sorry. Um, right, so choosing databases in literature reviews, um, that's, a, that's a critical task, of course. I would say that first and foremost, you should base a uh, selected based on your research questions uh, that, that should guide your selection. Uh, that the data, if the database cover my topic, I mean, if you look into to medical databases, might not have so much on, on forest related research, for example. Uh, so that's 
pretty obvious, clear, too important to, to include or to consider. What type of literature do I need to find? Because in different databases, different databases, sorry, cover different types of literature. Like journal articles, I would say most uh, most databases cover, uh, but then you have conference papers might not be in all the databases and patent standards and reports, uh, different databases for that. And if you look at the like thesis work, yeah, there are specific databases for that as well. And gray literature, uh, meaning that it's, it's a literature that is not necessarily peer reviewed, but in some context, this can be important to consider as well. And then there is uh, uh, databases you can find in this gray net, you can look for different uh, gray literature databases in terms, in turn. And then which journals are covered by the database refers a lot to what uh, topic, of course, and if it's a single or multidisciplinary topic, um, because the multidisciplinary databases like Google, <laughs> Scopus and Google Scholar, for example, uh, they usually cover multi, uh, different, mu different multiple uh, disciplines. Um, I would in general recommend to use multiple databases to not stick to just one, at least two uh, is a general recommendation. Uh, what is what can be challenging is that the, when you create your syntax for the search strategy, they differ a little bit how you construct those in different databases. You need to be aware of that. I said already the most common ones is Scopus, Web of Science, Google Scholar, and then there are others like Embase, Environment Complete, Medline, which is very more much into medicine, of course, and APA Psych Info, which is around psychology and so on. A few examples. Uh, this was uh, also an, a systematic review published. Oh, this is the protocol, yeah, in uh, in Forest, but they only suggest they will only look at in Web of Science and Scopus. As I said, this is a minimum two databases. Okay. And then this other protocol uh, about the bird mediated seed dispersal for natural forest. I, I find it a little bit fascinating. Here they have a really uh, elaborate way of identifying their databases they propose to use. So they're looking into the web of science, the core collection, and also then in the more specific like science cita citation index and so on. They also look into the zoological record, which is a specific database and uh, the CAB abstract, CLO citation index. Well, I will, I will be, well, you have this, you will have this on the, um, on the YouTube channel. So you can look into the details here later. And they also look into the, to specific websites and uh, web-based search and which is Google Scholar. And you see here at the bottom, this list was compiled with the help of experts and stakeholders. Again, I, I would strongly recommend you to, to, to do this if you, but for, for to look, reach out to other people and ask, okay, where, because nobody's an expert in everything. And I think those that actually work with your topic on the ground, that, that be it policymakers or practitioners or forest managers or whoever, they are probably the ones who have, they can have completely different ideas of where you can find your information. So take, take make use of that, take help of others. The search terms, yeah, that's a very, very important elaborate task. As I said, again, this is, uh, this is so important to go deep into from, from start. Um, brainstorm with yourself, with others to, to just come up with, with, you have your research question, you have that one nailed, and then you need to figure out how do I find the literature, all the literature on this topic, you need to find search terms, right? And you brainstorm in group, you just jot things down, whatever, and then you can look at previous reviews and look at what, what search terms they have used. Review key studies, usually you know there are a few really tiny, can be the pioneering papers, for example. Look at what's, what's, what terminology is in there. And then look at the most cited papers, like the list I presented before. Uh, look what terminology is used there. One thing is um, evident, of course, you think of synonyms, and this is part of the brainstorming, right? So you, you have forest, but then you also need to think about the wood, woodland, jungle, etc., and other related terms to, to, to be able to really capture everything that is going on. Established abbreviations, acronyms, and formula, and so on. 
like hardwood products, HWP, you need to, some, some studies don't include the entire term, so then you need to have to, to use the, the abbreviation as well. And then the spelling variations like British versus American English, you actually need to use other, uh, either you use truncation or you, you include both terms. Yeah, I keep on coming back to this because I was fascinated by this, uh, the fact that they consulted stakeholders. And so they asked also the stakeholders about um, if they had some thoughts or additions to add to the, to the search terms that the researchers had came up with. Um, you can also consult social media, LinkedIn, colleagues, basically ask, you can, you can write, okay, we're planning to do a review on this and that, what would you suggest, what such terms would you include? I think it's, I think it's a really good way to be able to, to ensure uh, that you really make your search uh, sensitive enough to capture as much as you, uh, as much as possible. Um, search strategy. So first you have your search terms, be it like uh, different search terms for forests. And then you, in the, in the database, you then combine this with something called Boolean operators. And they, these works in every database. Um, so there, there, I said there are different ways to, to do the search strategy in different databases, but the Boolean operators and or and not, uh, they work in every database. And let me see, maybe it shows even better on the next side. slide, yes. Um, so what they what this means the Boolean operator and that means that all search terms must occur to be retrieved. So you ask the database to look at uh, say um, forest and and climate. That means that you are only going to get get articles that are looking at both forest and climate. If you instead take forest or climate, then you get everything that is written on forest and everything that is written on climate. So you see, that will give you a much larger yield in general. When you combine with and, you, you will reduce your number of records. And when you work with or, you will uh, increase the yield instead. And then one way which, so and and or are those that you most commonly use. And then you can add not. Um, for example, we when we were working today with, today with the nature-based therapy, uh, review we're still working on the search term strategy for that one and we're struggling to get it down but what we, then we realized okay so we can include for example uh, not rabbit mouse mice rats etc because we were not interested in animal uh, studies and then you get can get rid of that chunk of the literature as well When you talk about the search strategy, <laughs> it tends to become a compromise between comprehensive and feasible. With comprehensive, I mean, is that you want to capture as much as possible. You want to get uh, get all the data in, get all the, the information. You don't want to miss any studies, but it also has to be feasible, right? You, if you really want to, I mean, you could look for absolutely everything and end up with 100,000 records. It is not feasible, right? So therefore you need to, to find different ways. Like I said, with this not, um, Boolean operator to get rid uh, of of um, records that you don't that you don't need to screen really. I would uh, recommend to to check if you get tasked with doing this to to check if you have an information scientist available within your institute, often a librarian who is an expert in developing these search strings. So you come to the information scientist. This is my research question. What would you suggest? How could we work around this? And you can get this um, advice from them. Then this, not every institute has it. My institute doesn't, for example. Uh, but it's absolutely worth checking if that uh, exists. Uh, there are also automated methods using natural language processing. I am not at all an expert on this, and I did discuss with uh, my colleague today, who is actually working quite a lot with artificial intelligence, and he. He said that uh, well, it's worth trying, but often with some common sense, you come up with more or less the same 
uh, results as um, AI tool or similar for identifying search terms particularly and, and identify or nailing the search strategy. But I just put, put, wanted to put this in here. If you're interested in looking in more automatized ways, you can you can have a look at this. Right, so this the issue of search terms. I re remember I said in the, in the very first search, we get when I put forest and systematic review, I got quite a lot from uh, from medicine records as well, and that is because within uh, like a, a forest plot is a, is a methodology to do a meta analysis. So for all of these, it has nothing to do with forests. It's just that it's it's talking about this methodology for systematic reviews. Yeah, so this is this is just an example of why it can become confusing. Um, the search string has to be developed based on your research question, of course. And this is an example of what is the economic impact of nature-based therapies. Um, yeah, so here you see in the first domain you use the nature nature-based therapies. Um, search terms and then you combine it with various search terms that goes for that can indicate uh, economic impact and so on all right so um the databases then the scopus interface is uh, i find it very uh, intuitive and user friendly web of science is pretty similar and web of science covers even more i just picked scopus because it's to, to to use to show you to demonstrate because it's a little bit cleaner for the purpose it looks like this so when you go into the scopus website uh the default is that you search uh in the start exploring there you search with an article title abstract and keywords uh, which would indicate the, the text where you want to find your search terms. And you can always filter um, to, to refine your search by year range, language area, subject area, document type, and so on. Uh, so this famous by now scoping review of human health co-benefits here we uh, after some discussions we decided to use the following search terms forest wood or hardwood products and uh, combine this with sink or substitution and so on this is the search string we wanted to use and when we put this use this in uh, in scopus i would recommend you to do okay so you see here we have this is pretty simple one but imagine it's longer but what you, you do it you don't put all of it into one but you take it in 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 sections uh for example like this so here we have just forest wood or hardwood product you search for that in title abstract and key you get more than one million documents don't worry you just go on and then in the next search uh step two you search for carbon or co2 get more than two million records don't worry and in number three, uh, you had uh, in step three, you put in the search terms for sync, substitution, stock change, or sequestration. And here you get a little bit fewer because we have an and in there. Uh, never mind. Okay. So the the nice thing is that you run these searches and you get them, they get listed. You don't need to do anything. You don't have to save or anything. They end up there in the in the list in Scopus, and it's the same in the more or less the same in the other databases. And what you do then is that you combine these queries. So you combine the search uh, two with the three and the four, and then you get the results. And here we come down to, so from more than 2 million, when you combine them, obviously you get lower, uh, a lower number of records. So here we came down to 12,000 uh, something. It's already, that's already a lot, but it's becoming close to feasible and doable. Um, then you continue within these, uh, for example, in these 12,000 records, uh, you look at the title and abstract, and then you think about your exclusion and inclusion criteria, and wherever you exclude something, you need to be aware of why you exclude it. And with blind screening, I mean, basically that you do it, you have to, as I said before, it has to be a teamwork, you have to be two. Uh, people and you should not be aware of what the other reviewer is including and not because that um, then you can compare your results and you get some sort of um, transparency. 
yeah right so i guess so for example i choose that i want to have this one managing forest for offsetting carbon footprints if i had chosen to include that you just click uh, and say okay this is an important uh, relevant record for my review and then what do you do with these uh, records uh, you put them in some reference management software and the note is not for free but mendeley and sotero are and there are other um, reference management softwares as well that you can use um right i'm i'm and about time so it's 4 15 um, so have it. because what i wanted to actually introduce you to is a tool called rayan um it is an automatized tool but it is very very helpful for you if you're going to do systematic reviews and uh, how to do this without okay you have this but please when you when you watch this you can hopefully copy i can send the pdfs or something to annie and you can um, have a look at this tutorial yourself so you don't do this now um the results uh, are presented in a flow chart this goes for every type of review this is what this is the first piece of result you will get up with, which tells you where you tell, say how many uh, re records you got and how many you excluded in the different steps based on, you could exclude them based on title, based on abstract, based on the full article screening. And then finally, how many studies you included in the end to be reviewed for the full, to be full reviewed for the article, for the review article. And what you then do is that once you have identified the articles that correspond to the, the, the inclusion criteria, you have identified that you need to answer your research questions. Um, you need to go through all the, the those texts that you have uh, that you have uh, included and um, review them in detail, of course. And this should be done by at least two different authors. And you put them into what you do then is that you also have a a priori uh, determined defined data extraction sheet where you have the information uh, determined uh, that you want to include or get out from the articles. And that should basically be be what we need to answer the questions of the review. Uh, if you're an old schooler like myself, you use Excel and just put in all the different details you want uh, and then just go through the articles and find all this information and put it into the, and, and summarize it. You summarize it and put it into your Excel sheet. And this is what the, these Ryan tools, uh, artificial intelligence tools can help you with to make this more uh, efficient and possibly even more uh, transparent actually. So this is just showing the difference. This is a very typical. I'm, I'm, it looks a bit boring, but this is this is the typical way you do it. You have your your the data you want to get out, and you you just have to write it down, and then you summarize it for the full article. So uh, in the end, when you get it to the article, you use all this information that you had in your Excel sheet in this case, and bring it into a more structured way that is possible to read and understand for people in the field. Uh, yes, so mentioning, since I mentioned artificial intelligence, uh, the reasons why we might need it is also, as I said, the increasing number of studies makes it unfeasible. In 1753, it was probably not a huge deal to do to conduct a review on scurvy, but I think today, uh, with millions and millions of articles, it would be a completely different task. Artificial intelligence tends to be more efficient than in, in time-wise in comparison to an um, individual um, human mind. It actually addresses the issue of subjectivity, artificial intelligence. It's a machine. It's machine learning, which, which removes the human subjectivity. Uh, the human error becomes more transparent because the, 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 um, the methodology can be replicated in exactly the same way which you can't really do when you're talking about single human brains, right? Mm, there are many, of course, many things, but I don't know, you're probably much more familiar with artificial intelligence than I am myself. 
Um, but of course, there are limitations to it as well. And the main thing is, of course, that you need to, to you need yourself as a researcher or a student be aware, first of all, and train it really well on exactly the research questions you want to have answered and so on. So that is why that is key to have that clear from the start. Um, yeah, I again pasted this, the, the link to this paper uh, about machine learning frameworks for uh, systematic reviews. I honestly think uh, this is just coming. This is published in 2021, so it's just a couple of years ago. But I think like with many other things, the artificial intelligence um, will take over quite a lot of the systematic review uh, methods uh, that I have been presenting today. Uh, however, I think that's before embarking on using these kind of tools, it's important to know um, like the basics, like like what is actually in it, what is it that this artificial intelligence is doing. So from that perspective, I think it's important to know the, the manual tools as well. Um, yes, this was just to show what the issue of feasibility, that with time, um, there's so much research going on. Uh, I'm sure you, if you've just been studying a, a couple of years, even then, I think you will have realized that they're coming out new studies in your topics every week. And so this was an analysis from almost well, so, some eight years ago now, where they found that the volume of publications in general, scientific publications doubles approximately every 24 years, which is obviously a challenge for systematic reviews. And there was uh, there is a specific I wanted to mention this because I, I checked it up and it seems to be a pretty neat uh, are the AS review tool uh, a specific um, uh, artificial intelligence uh, review tool uh, which is open source is ready to use it uses active learning and so on and it can be extended across uh, across systems uh, again. Um, I suggest you have a look if you're interested um, at the different sources here. I mentioned in the beginning the quality of evidence and uh, traditionally this has been assessed with the grade, the grading of recommendations, assessment, development and evaluations system. Uh, it was again developed based on the need for a strong evidence base before implementing the treatments and interventions in medicine. Um, what it tells us, the grade scale tells us if a uh, study is of, uh, if, if the evidence coming out from a study is of high quality. And that basically means that further research is very unlikely to change our confidence in the estimates of effect. Um, you could say, for example, uh, the, the for many of the uh, climate change studies today, the scenario modeling studies, I think there's a very high quality of evidence. We see that, unfortunately, uh, the, the, um, the results suggested by previous researchers have been very well confirmed by reality. So we cannot, unfortunately, not expect that uh, further research will change our confidence in what previous uh, climate change researchers have concluded. Moderate quality, obviously there could be an idea with further research since it could uh, change our confidence and low quality and very low quality. Very low quality evidence is often what we get from anecdotal uh, case studies, small case studies. They would say that the, the, the level of evidence is, is low, has a low quality. I'm sure you're aware of this already. Um, a key aspect of the quality is bias. And bias is whether basically if you can, uh, what should I say? Yeah. No, um, it's a biased result is when it deviates from the truth, <laughs> as simple as that, uh, that is bias. And a specific form of, of bias when it comes to systematic reviews, uh, that the quality, because also the quality of a systematic review can be assessed. And if we want to look at that, uh, a specific form that uh, of bias that uh, systematic reviews are at risk for is publication bias. You know, for example, that 
um, studies with negative results or zero results are less likely to be published because researchers want to have come come with interesting results and we <laughs> we of course well, i'm not saying we but um, but it's uh what shall i say it's quite a lot as well from scientific it's much more difficult there are not most scientific journals as well wants to have uh, studies that want to have studies that show some positive results or show some results whatsoever but i mean there are even there are even journals called journals for negative results or something uh, or no or zero results and how this is obviously important because that means that okay if you if you conclude from your systematic review that there is evidence for this and that and to, that the effect is this and that it's important to consider that yeah but hey have we come to this because there's so much results lying around in in drawers in, in different offices and so on that have never been published uh okay and then in the systematic review or in the review article as such you can do different ways of presenting uh presenting uh, the the bias and what you do is then you assess this per different uh per the different articles that you have included in the review and you can give different indicators this is just an example of how you can present it because this is uh the conclusion of a review should tell you what do we know and what don't we know and where is more research needed and depending on that review, you could also, like a scoping review, might be able to uh, as well answer the question, how should it be conducted? And is there enough high quality evidence to provide recommendations for policymakers, planners, practitioners, and so on? Usually, not always, systematic reviews come up with more concise conclusions, while scoping reviews tend to be more like i lost the text there more conceptual like I, I showed you i had this conceptual model so it's more like while, while a systematic review can come up more with like a yes and no answer is there enough evidence for this yes or no it's not as easy as that the scoping reviews are more of a contextual kind <laughs> Yeah, uh, I went through this in a little bit different way than I had um, anticipated because I thought I had more time. Um, anyhow, if you're interested uh, in getting more uh, more information on this, there are really good online methods courses on evidence synthesis that you can uh, sign up for. And this is one that I would actually recommend. Um, which could be really helpful if you want to do a, a systematic review or any kind of evidence synthesis in the future. Um, have a look at this website and, and you can sign up for, for different workshops there as well. Okay, so now it's time for questions, if there is time left. As I said, I was not quite aware of the time. Awesome. Uh, thank you so much. I think we did have a couple questions and um, we can just quickly go over some that people talked about. Um, there was one question about, let's see, the first one was uh, for a systematic review, you just, you generally work as a team. Is that also generally the same for a scoping review as well? Yes, uh, it is uh, definitely. Yes, I would say, it's a good question, but systematic reviews are really about this objective assessment of the evidence. But for sure, scoping reviews, I, I had this one. Other, yeah, no, scoping reviews are also, it's a lot about the, also the extraction of data has to be done as a, as a team. Yes. Awesome. Um, Jacenia, um had a question about why the protocol needs to be published in a different paper. Generally, do you do that? how much longer uh, before you publish the paper or yeah, how much earlier do you have to do that? And then is there a specific time frame between the publication of the protocol and the paper? Oh, that's great. That's a good question as well. Okay, A, you don't have to publish, you don't have to publish the protocol. Uh, you, what I would say is that you usually have to register it, but not even that is necessary. It's a good idea to register it. And there is Prospero, for example, is a, uh, is, good to publish it because you get another publication but it's also more for for the research community <clears throat> uh, for the research community that that um, people see that something is going on 
and it's also a transparency question. The timeline is there's nothing, there's no strict guidelines for that. Uh, I would recommend to simply see this thing with a with a protocol and to publish it as as a way to is a time management way for yourself. Okay, you 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 have it there, you have it published, you have it, and then you keep on keep on going, keep on working with it like that. But there is no there is no it's not mandatory to to publish it, uh, but it's advisable. Awesome. Um, and Maria had a question about if it's better to generally use Scopus, Web of Science, and then some other people are also chiming in if you have opinions on like Google, Google Scholar or ResearchGate in terms of finding literature. Hmm. Yeah, good. No, Scopus is actually not open source, open access. I've realized I've always used Scopus because of, as I said, I think the interface is really, really neat. And I think most in institutes, if you're working at an institute, would have subscription to it. Um, uh, sorry, what was the question again? Which, which oh, so I just would recommend? Like, yeah, in terms of Scopus, Web of Science, Google Scholar. Yeah, no. This, so when we're talking, because all of these three are interdisciplinary, right? Uh, so they would cover everything. If you know a little bit more exactly what topic you're into, there are more specific uh, databases, but those you would need to 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 find based on your own discipline. Um, but web, web of science, usually you get more. Uh, it covers even more than Scopus. Google Scholar is... Uh, you would probably get even much, much more from Google Scholar. The problem with Google Scholar is that it's not always peer reviewed. You don't, you, you have to be more careful when you pick the records there and really check uh, critically the, the sources uh, before you include uh, material from Google Scholar. Usually the quality mm -hmm. control is higher in the others. Awesome. Um, there was another question about for effect sizes in papers, uh, these kind of reviews. Is it valid to use raw mean difference um, as this person's seen a lot of papers use SMD or RR instead? Uh, what did you say? What did you say? For the um, effect sizes? Yeah, it was from uh, Jesenia at 928. <laughs> Raw mean difference and RR, what did you say? Re okay, relative risk or no? I'm not sure what the abbreviations are. Um, and this was for the other response ratio. Um, mm -hmm. So how to calculate the effect. So this is what you often do with, uh, with the meta analysis. Um, where you look at the effect sizes and that that's you can use you can use it depends on what the what the what the studies have used what outcome measure they have used and what statistical uh indicator um i'm not sure i understand the, the question entirely um i'm sorry um, that's okay maybe jesenia can uh type a little bit more about it and we can come back to that in a little yeah, bit yeah um, there was a question too about what if a working team is not possible? Yeah, uh, for sure. Uh, <laughs> that's a sad situation, um, but that can happen, of course. Uh, what I basically, what I think I wanted to say is that A, I wanted to, to protect you because I think this happens sometimes that we think uh, that it's just your review of the literature. And sure, you can do that on your own, um, but you cannot expect it to be um, what you would call a, a publishable systematic review or a publishable scoping review or either of these, because what what is what means is that it has to be uh, reproducible and transparent. Uh, if there is not a team available, you can, of course, do your own um, research. I think and nowadays, isn't it so that we can do work as teams, even if we are not physically at the same place? So I would really recommend to try and find colleagues or others who are interested in the same topic and work together online or something. That's that's perfectly possible with these kind of tasks. Mm -hmm. And then another, like, if something is missing, but what do you do if there's no previous research paper or work in what you're trying to review? Ah, <laughs> then you cannot review it. <laughs> uh, there should be at least, uh, I mean, that is what I said. Uh, when do you do a review when there is enough uh, 
um, to to do a review. And yeah, because we see this now, it's actually there is uh, there are I mean the coming reviews in the beginning there were reviews of where they included three studies or something, and you cannot draw a lot of conclusions from that. Um, so if there is not enough studies, you, my my simple answer is then you can't do a review. <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, and do you have any journal suggestions for publishing a systematic review in forest science? Well, yeah, no. Uh, <laughs> um, I unfortunately, as I said, I'm not a, I'm not a, uh, I'm not a forester myself. So my my knowledge of um, forest related journals is not the highest. I like the question. I, I realize I should have a good answer to this. Could I could I have a look into this and get back to you? I I can send it to you or Annie, and you can mm -hmm. share it with the with the group of students. Yeah, absolutely. And then there's one question um, about AI. So, is there AI to extract the content of a full paper inside of Quillbot? Um, Quillbot is limited and is realized to not be good enough to extract extract papers with lots of numbers. Um. Yeah. Uh, I'm not um. I, I don't know. My answer is I don't know. The uh, artificial intelligence is not my topic, but I'm pretty sure that there are other tools um, should be possible to find out through some of the links that they put for the artificial intelligence uh, searches. Because yes, for sure, there are there are tools. I know that much that um, that can you can really use it to extract this data in a nice uh, in a nice way rather than having to do it. Um, uh, on your own so the machine can do it for you awesome um and can gray literature be referred to and quoted within the systematic literature review yeah it can um uh, basically uh what's what you always have to do is to say up front what you're doing and what you're not doing as long as you describe what you're doing but you can do anything it just has to be clear you have in the methods then you write in your your methods yeah we include gray literature and this is the rationale for doing this. And yeah, that's that's absolutely fine. It just has to be clear from the beginning. We are including gray literature in this review. And it's fine. Mm -hmm. Awesome. And then I think um, Jacenia sent back a clarification um, uh, for the little uh, the question a little bit earlier. But she said, for meta-analysis studies based on the means, I have seen that is mostly used as standard mean difference and response ratio. But I was wondering, um, if raw mean difference, or why not raw mean difference? And she's uh, they've seen very few studies with it. And if there's yeah. a particular reason for that. That's a good question. Uh, actually, I'm sorry, I don't uh, have the answer. I have not done system uh, meta analysis myself uh, in the reviews I've done. So um, I'm afraid I can't answer that. Okay. Um, okay. And then just to clarify, is the screening data usually done manually? You, yes, what, so far it is, but I think, as I said, I think artificial intelligence will come uh, take over quite a lot with that as we become more and more uh, skilled in training the machines or using or putting the questions uh, correctly for the machine or artificial intelligence to do it for us. Them. Um, that looks like all of the questions that I've seen so far. Um, I did want to share, there were two things I wanted to do. Um, I just wanted to share a quick thing about IUFRO again. There's the World Congress coming up in June of 2024. And I believe this is one of the largest forestry conferences in the world. Um, so it's a really great opportunity. And so uh, I think that Sandra just forgot to share the slides and invite everybody. So everyone is invited to learn more and attend. And so this is the kind of take takeaway message or their, their goal, which is for us and societies and towards the future. And it's a good opportunity to share, showcase your work. And there have registrations right now at iufra2024.com. So that can be something that you look into. And then one last thing is, if you haven't seen the chat, Annie sent out the feedback form 
And so while you're filling that out, if everyone doesn't mind turning on their camera, we can all take a group picture for showing up to this meeting together and just remember, have the good memories. So, yay. Awesome. I'll give everyone a couple more seconds. Awesome. Okay. Smile. <laughs> Very real quick. Lovely. Okay. Um, and with that, I just wanted to say thank you again for everybody attending. Thank you again, Matilda, for giving a lovely um, but short presentation. If we get any more questions, we'll make sure to send that out. We'll be sending out um, certificates once you do the feedback form. And um, yeah, it'll be posted on YouTube. But yeah, thank you everybody for coming. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you for your session.